says it gives me the option of leaving meeting. Should I go and leave? <laughs> Back out now, Dan. Got it. All right. So it's good. All right. <clears throat> Welcome back to another episode of the Young Guides Podcast. I'm Keaton, and this is I'm Kyle. And today we have Dan Atkinson on with us, uh, well known as Flyfish Dan. Um, he does uh, YouTube videos for uh, fly fishermen and women of all different skill levels, and uh, it's just getting in and and showing people where to fish and how to fish, and you know, um, just getting out there and. Uh, it's been really beneficial to a lot of people uh, here in Washington State and probably around the United States and the world. So uh, we're really honored for him to take some time out today and hop on our podcast. So with that being said, welcome to the podcast, Dan. Happy to he be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem. <clears throat> well, let's kick this thing off, Dan. Tell us uh, about your background. Tell us about yourself. Well, let's see. On the on the fishing side, I've been fishing my entire life. Um, ever since I was old enough to hold a fishing pole, and it's funny, <clears throat> I recently did a presentation for a fly fly club, one of my first ones, and I was looking for some pictures in my youth. Uh, and of course, back when I was young, there wasn't any digital files, right? You have to have a like an actual <laughs> physical photograph. And the first one I could find was my brother and I. And it was a fishing derby that's held. I think it's still held in Montesano, Washington. And ironically, he won the derby. And I'm just kind of standing next to him with a fly rod, no fish, or with a regular spinning gear, no fish. But he he won that that particular derby. And, and I ended up being the person that fishes, you know, nonstop. My brother fishes a little, but not like I do. But I fished my entire youth uh, with my dad a lot out in the Puget Sound and my grandfather. Um, and it was, I was mid-teenager when I first picked up a fly rod. And really from that point on, I've never looked back when it comes to fishing. But I'm born and raised in Washington State. My dad likes to tell the story that eighth generation, which brings our family like back when it was the Oregon Territory. So been uh, a lot of my roots are in Washington and my family's roots are here as well. Cool. So you said your dad and your grandfather got you into fishing, but who was like your inspiration when getting into fly fishing? Was it kind of self-fed or did you get into it via like seeing someone do it or how did you go about that? So my dad was the inspiration. So we fished a ton when, and I think it was because I would go with them almost every Saturday. And, you know, I am the middle child. I have an older brother and a younger sister. And I was the only one willing to stay out in his Boston Whaler, rain or shine, get up at 3.30 in the morning, be home at dark. And I didn't talk a lot. So I think that's prob probably why uh, he would invite me to all the fishing trips. But yeah. when I became a teenager, right, you get involved in school, you get high school. Uh, I'm, I'm sure looking back at it, my dad was trying to build that bridge, you know, with his teenage son. So he picked up fly fishing, bought me my first fly rod and said, Hey, you gotta, you gotta come try this. So my first trip was with him out to dry falls Lake back in the eighties, like mid eighties. Oh. And so he was, he was my inspiration for picking up the sport. And then from there, I mean, he would, he taught me some pointers along the way, but I'm pretty much self-taught from that point on. I mean, back then there wasn't YouTube and there wasn't really any instructions other than books. So you just kind of had to learn as you go, but he was my inspiration for fly fishing for sure. So where did you where did you uh, go from there? Where did that uh, fly fishing journey take you then? Once you had that first trip at Dry Falls, it was um, I mean cliche, right? I was definitely hooked on fly fishing when I first started. Just the trying to describe it recently in in a video to where there's a big difference, right? I had an I had a Shimano Ultralight and would fish that a ton. When you have a fish initially strike it, I mean you know you feel. I mean it's that. Ad immediate adrenaline rush right when a fish hammers your your spin gear or your lure well when you're holding on to the fly line and that happens it's just a whole different feel and it was not to have anything between myself really and the fish it was like wow the fight was completely different the feel was totally different the challenge i love the challenge of fly fishing and i mean i became obsessed with it really is the best way to put it um, got my friends also taught friends how to fly fish after I started learning. Um, and 
fished a lot of the desert lakes in eastern Washington is where I did a ton of fishing. Um, and then from there, worked into fishing other states. From there, worked into fishing other countries and trying to catch pretty much anything and everything on a fly rod. Um, but I mean, I've, I've literally never looked back. And so I still, I do traditional fish probably very little, right? It's 99.9% .9 fly fishing. But a lot of times if I'm out in the Puget Sound, you don't always have opportunities to catch a salmon on a fly rod. So I have used traditional gear um, and downriggers and that thing, type of thing during some trips, but it's mostly fly fishing from there. And I always bring the fly rod just in case because you never know. Yeah, that's rad. So you talk about like traveling, you've done all this traveling and fishing and going all these places. At what point were you like, hey, I better put like a camera on all this while I'm doing it? interesting you say that because i've always i've always taken still pictures right media in a filming type of it's it hasn't become really easy uh, i think in the past and since the past 10 years right because even 10 years ago i found a couple videos that i did you remember the old flip camera that little <laughs> thing that i had a few few done on that and but to try to take video back in 80s and 90s and even 2000s i mean you had a camcorder or it wasn't easy to do right especially if you're doing it pov it was almost impossible to do so i started i mean i've found some old video 20 years old of me fishing but it's terrible and shaky and whatever else the first video i ever uh put on to youtube was back in 2009 and it was on a flip camera and it was it was awful just terrible but that's what i started i wanted to try to to you know kind of document some of my fishing trips and at that time my kids were getting older and i thought it'd be cool for them to look back and and see it i didn't really seriously start getting into that until about three years ago like really filming you know with a purpose yeah Gotcha. And what what um, caused you to really like take it more seriously and really really get into it? So that's a it's a good story, and it's actually my wife Amy encouraged me to do it right when the pandemic hit. Um, a lot of negativity in the world, right? A lot of a lot of fear out there, and and I found myself overly obsessing about that. So one day as i'm you know as i'm recording the nightly news because i wanted to hear the next update right it's just it wasn't a healthy time for a lot of people right back back when the pandemic hit she goes you know you need to focus your energy on something else and i was like, like what she goes start up a youtube channel teach people how to fly fish do something other than record the nightly news so i'm like okay so i decided in that moment that it was a it was a needed positive creative outlook for myself um which then turned out to be that for others it was this place that people could escape all the negativity and i just wanted to spread the joy of fly fishing and it just kind of organically took on almost a teaching as i was fishing because i felt like i needed to let the viewers know what i was using and some of the tactics that i was doing so it kind of organically evolved into what it is today but it started because i needed a positive distraction for myself and realized quickly that it was it was the same for others that were looking for that same escape away from all the bad news and then others that were looking to get into fly fishing and and then it just kind of took off from there no real plan that's what i was going to ask you i was like did you have like any like idea <laughs> what you wanted to shape your youtube channel into or like but you kind of answered it there saying that you just you just kind of went with the flow huh so, yeah still am still am just kind of going with the flow yeah i was gonna say like now do you have any plans for it or what what's your like when you're getting ready to plan a video what's going through your mind are you like oh i'm gonna go fish this area and make a video out of it or are you um just like when I'm, you're like a buddy asks you to go fishing and you're like, I'm taking my camera with me and we're making something of this. So I've, uh, that is also evolved. So I, I have, uh, I've never sat down and really written the script for anything. 
everything I talk about is really just kind of off the cuff. And when I find inspiration, I'll just talk about a subject and film it. Um, you know, I've learned a lot of things along the way to tell a better story with adding B-roll and uh, to make uh, visuals out of some of the things that I say. A lot of trips I'll, I'll go out and, you know, I just want to get out there and fish and then it'll evolve in the moment as well. It'll evolve during the day. I'll have an idea that pops up middle of the trip and say, hey, you know, I probably should talk to anyone that's watching that that might want to know how to fish an indicator or this tactic that I was doing fishing a streamer that might help them catch fish. So it literally evolves while I'm fishing. And I really don't, sometimes I go with a plan in mind and then it completely changes throughout the day as well. But I have sat down and done some planned videos, like some of the gift giving ideas that I've done, or especially today. Um, it's, it's tough as a creator to continue to find new things to talk about. So what I've done now is is started started to tell some of the backstories on some of the trips that I've taken. I'm sitting at, you know, I have a little lake trailer that I'll sit by the fire and just tell the story of what happened on this particular trip and then play some of the clips that I that I took to kind of bring viewers in on how that trip came about and why I go there and why it might be special to me and things like that. So my I really have a very loose agenda on and I have inspiration from other creators and things that happen in my life or people that ask questions that inspire me to make the next video. Yeah, that's cool. That's rad. But I do love, I love the creative process. I mean, it's been, it's been, uh, uh, it's been good, good for me in that, in that creative process and just kind of getting all the stuff and imagination I've always had out in a video. I mean, I'm not the greatest editor on um, on the store on the planet, but you know, it's I really enjoy getting into the editing room and creating the story that I just experienced, you know, the day before. So, what would you say? Like, what is your YouTube looking like now? I mean, back when you first started, like you were saying, it, we were kind of letting it transform and grow on itself. What does it What does it look like now for your channel? Well, it's still, you know, it's still definitely a, a DIY channel. I mean, a uh, um, party of one, right? Me, myself, that's it. I taught cool. myself how to edit. So my edits are, are it's not great. It's, it's definitely YouTube-esque, but I've gotten a lot better with the editing and I've gotten some great tips along the way from people that have reached out to me um, to kind of give me some editing tips. One in particular, I have, I have a pretty good story behind that as well, if you're interested in hearing that. But Yeah, go for it. So I, I thought initially when I was editing, you, you know, I had all these tools at the ready with all these different transition, you know, flip screens and turning around and, you know, blurring in and out and things like that. And I had a guy reach out to me and said, Hey, <clears throat> you know, I'll trade you. And I was like, what do you mean? He goes, well, I've got some editing tips for you. Uh, but I also, you know, kind of want to know where your secret Alpine Lake is. So if you let me know where that Alpine Lake is, I'll trade you with for some some editing tips that I think that will make a big difference on your channel. So I engaged him a little bit more and, and, you know, I'm thinking, is this guy just trying to find my, you know, my secret lake that I've been fishing and, and posting. So then he, uh, so I was like, you know, are you, uh, you know, is this real type of thing? So he, he sends me a picture of an Emmy and I'm looking, I'm like, really, <laughs> this can't be real. And I'm like, is that a real Emmy? Then he sends me a picture of five Emmys. And I zoom in on him, and it's his name on him. He was an Emmy award-winning director and producer for Como News for like 20, 30 years. Wow. And, and I was like, okay, this guy's definitely got some credibility. His name's James Owen. I, he wouldn't mind me uh, letting you guys know who he is. And from there, I mean, we've, we've evolved into a great friendship. And he's, he gave me some tips on editing. Um, and they were so powerful. One of the first videos I did that was under his tutelage uh, ended up making um, Orvis uh, their Friday night film festival. And that was one of the first videos that made that, that uh, Orvis page because he showed me how to tell a better story visually. And he and I have become great friends and fished together. And he's just a solid guy. But the, the evolution of that, story is so cool just the way that it kind of turned out and 
And one of the, the, uh, one of the biggest benefits of this whole YouTube journey are some of the people that I've met along the way, like James. Yeah. That's rad. Yeah. It's pretty cool. So how have you kind of, I guess, made your way into the fishing industry? Like how have you made connections? How have you seen yourself, you know, go from maybe somebody that was just fishing and um now growing into you know i i would put you um and like um like an educator i guess in the industry um somebody who um is a, i would say your name in the industry right like you go to your youtube page you pop up you know i'll, I'll see your stuff on my own uh, when i'm going browsing through youtube so i would say you're kind of becoming a name in the industry um you're creating content what would you like, what did that whole process look like and, and how do you view yourself in that? Well, I definitely, uh, uh, and I, I said this also in my, one of my first presentations at a, at a uh, fly group, fly fishing group, I said, I'm, I'm no expert, right? I mean, I think one of the appeal of my channel is that uh, I know a lot about fly fishing and I have a lot of practical experience. You know, I've been casting a fly rod for 35 years you know, but for me to name every single fly that's out there or all the terminology that's out there in fly fishing, I don't know everything. And I think that's part of my appeal is that I take some of that intimidation out of the sport. I mean, if you have somebody that really nerds out on fly fishing, go for it, right? If you want to know every single size of every single bug there is and every single fly tying tool and all that, then great. But I just, I never did that myself. I, I understand how to fly fish and, and the basics. And I have success when I fly fish. And I think that's part of my appeal on the YouTube channel that even though, you know, I don't, I don't perceive myself in it as an expert, I can certainly help somebody that's new to the sport or maybe have, has, hasn't thought of a certain way or a certain strategy to catch more fish or help them with their casting their fly rod, that type of thing. So I've, I've turned into kind of a, James called me the, the every man's fly fisherman type of thing to where I'm, I can be relatable because I don't get stuck in the weeds when it comes to all the nuances that fly fishing offers and why I think a lot of people stay away from the sport because they think it's too complicated. So I try to strip that away. And I think that comes across in my YouTube video uh, videos. And I'm, um, and I've always spoke about that in my life and all the people that I've taught how to fly fish is it's kind of strip away the intimidation factor when it comes to um, fly fishing. Yeah. I would just like to say too, you know, you've talked about coming in during like the pandemic and, and everything, and you really set the tone for all these new people coming in. Cause at that time, a bunch of new anglers were showing up, you know, to join our, our wonderful party of fly fishermen and women. So it it's and it's a good inspiration for these new people getting in and then you know the questions like you said you know your videos are relatable they're simple not like you're not getting too in depth where a new angler would be like well i fly fish dan said i needed this size 22 midge with a gold head and a black you know body you were just like i'm using this shape right here and and we're fishing it and i'm catching fish so if you can get in this ballpark go fish it and then people you know from what i would see on like the fly fishing washington page and stuff they're like hey this tip really worked great i didn't get it exactly but i caught fish thank you dan you know so that was that's really cool to see and see how you've uh essentially like bloomed you know out of that so and that that is my why right um I, I continue doing this because of stuff like that, right? To be able to inspire others to get out there and fly fish, inspire the younger generation to pick it up, inspire the older generation to get back out there and pick it up again. Yeah. That's that's my why, right? And it's um, it's been humbling. You know, some of the some of the messages that I've gotten are just humbling. Uh, with people reaching out to me and you know i had a 16 year old kid reach out to me and give me a super thanks which is this little heart you can press on youtube and he donated two dollars and 99 cents and just said you know i just wanted to find a way to give back and thank you for everything you're doing and it's a 16 year old kid right to be able to have influence on somebody who's 16 who's in a stage of their life where they could go 
lots of different directions, right? As teenagers, yeah. that that's a pretty humbling and cool thing to do. And, and then to, to have some of the older generation reach out and say, Hey, you know, I've set down the fly rod for years. And after watching your videos, I just I had to get back out there and do it again. So I think I'm like in this perfect age group to where I can inspire the younger generation and be viewed as somebody, you know, who, who knows how to fly fish and has success. And also the older generation that may have fished their entire lives, but just for whatever reason, you know, in their lives, they just haven't fished for a while and they, they get inspired to go back out there and do it again. So it's, uh, it's been a super cool and hum humbling experience. Um, and that is my why. That's cool. So with the, with the good comments comes bad comments, right? How do you go about uh, dealing with those negative comments and naysayers? I mean, at the end of the day, people are always going to say stuff, right? And it's especially easy in this age of technology behind a, a screen and a comment section. You know, you say something um, and essentially like people get, af you know, afraid to ask questions. And this is, but you're like that, that person pushing through, staying positive and doing good things for the industry. So what, what do you do to combat uh, the, like the negative questions? Or not so, questions, comments. If if we're being completely candid, right? That that is something that that I struggle with at times, um, and can can be tough to manage. Um, you have to have a thick skin, right? Early on, that was really new to me. I was surprised on some of the you know they call them trolls, things like that. I was really surprised in some of the negative comments that come through. Now, granted, out of all the comments, right, that I receive maybe one percent are negative but a lot of times a, a rear friend recently described it to me some of those comments are like a sliver right they're just they get under your skin and they're they, they're aggravating and they hurt for a while right so i have to i have to i have to work at it at times especially as i continue to get bigger and in that platform my reach is greater so that one percent becomes a bigger number and it's it's sometimes <clears throat> excuse me it sometimes is tough to filter out some of the negative comments and a lot of times i'm successful at it and can just move past and sometimes they 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 get to me and it's something that i have to, to work on and continue to work on that the negative part and remember the why right remember the why that i'm doing it and that helps helps manage through some of the, the negativity but it's it's you know, you get those keyboard warriors out there that just want to tear you down for whatever reason. And, you know, I block some people on Instagram for that. I block some people on Facebook for that. I can mute people on the YouTube channel. So, you know, they have to get pretty snarky with me uh, for, for me to, to do that. Uh, because I think everyone should have a voice and opinion, just like I do. But if it becomes really disrespectful, you know, in my own mind, I have kind of a two strike rule, right? If you continue to do that, then I'm just going to mute you and you know you don't need to be part of the message that i'm trying to spread which is positivity kindness inclusiveness accessibility all of that um but it it you know it's interesting you asked me that question because just recently i had to block a couple people on instagram because i rarely ever name the spots that i fish rarely but there were a couple of people on instagram that were recognized the spot I was fishing and essentially we're laying down some not very nice comments and and saying not very nice things about you know if they were to see me out there filming again so you know that that's the kind of stuff that kind of is the sliver on occasion um mm -hmm. but you know when you put yourself out there like I have uh, you have to be prepared to manage some of that and I do my best to have a kind response and not lash out and take the high road and that's and that's really the best way to handle anyone that's just looking to spread negativity right try to yeah. kill them with kindness it's the crazy thing to me about this the whole thing about negative comments and people getting mad about hot spotting and stuff is like the age of technology that we're in in all the different platforms not just your platform but like all you know youtube people talking on facebook groups people talking over instagram like that 
spot has probably been talked about like hundreds of times, maybe thousands of times, and people just don't realize it. But when you put it into uh, a video and and people don't realize, too, is that just because you put it in a video doesn't mean everyone's going to go out and just bombard it. That's the thing that I don't get with like the negative comments is like you make a video people and it's like they're expecting just thousands of people to show up on it. And it's like, that's not necessarily the case. And not everyone's going to be able to look at a, a place in the background and go, Oh, I know exactly where that spot is. I'm going to go and fish it. So the only people that can do that are the people that have been there before. Yeah. And I've had, I've had that conversation. You know, if, if there's a prominent landmark somewhere, you know, I'm careful to keep that out of the video if I want to keep the place private. But if there's a, random field and a hill behind me the only people that are going to recognize that are the people that have fished it before no one is going to be able to triangulate where i'm at based off of my my background right and you said it perfectly right it's it's it you know the, what what we do and what i do it's about inspiring others to get out there and try the sport and fly fish not pave a road map to to where to go or all my favorite spots i share a few that are very commonly known like the Yakima River, Coldwater Lake, or the couple that I talk about all the time. But, you know, the, it, everything else, though, just because it's on video, exactly as you said, doesn't mean there's going to be hordes of people that show up, because the reality is uh, there's no way that they're going to know where I'm at if I don't talk about it, period. Yeah. The only people that know are the people that have been there. Yeah, totally agree. That was a learning thing for me and early on. When I first started with YouTube channel, like, I'm here in the Yakima River. I'm here on this river. I'm here in this river. Like, ooh. you know, it's it's not about me naming all the spots. It's about me inspiring, getting people out there. So I've shifted gears when it comes to naming where I'm fishing because at the end of the day, you know, I have a few people that will private message me and and ask, and and I have accommodated some people uh, with information. But um, it's definitely a balance, right? It's uh, but I I learned. That it's not oh it's not it's not about hot spotting every place I go right it's about inspiring people to, to get out there yeah and you know the areas you go and fish like you fish on like you can tell the scenery right like I think the takeaway that people should take away is that the things that you fish and that you're using can work in a lot of the same ge geographical areas in that time frame right so like. If you're fishing a western washington river and you use this certain pattern i mean there's a few things that change up but for the most part you can go out and fish something closer or nearby you and still get that the same results i agree <clears throat> so what about um do people recognize you when you're on the water and you're filming is have you ever had any i guess confrontations about that or is it mostly like positive interactions with people 99.99% positive. So I've only, I've only had one uh, interaction recently in Eastern Washington that I would say it was not very positive. And that was one of the people that I ended up blocking on Instagram. Um, but that aside, the, the, it's kind of a, it's, I'm not, I'm not super used to that yet because there was always anonymity, right? When I'm out there fly fishing prior to the YouTube channel, people just saw me as another angler. And now it, it's often when I go out, I'm recognized and it's, it's kind of shocking. And my stepson, Kobe, I think gets a little bit annoyed with it on occasion when people come up, are you fly fish Dan kind of thing? I watch your videos and he's just like rolling his eyes. Come on down, let's go fishing. Um, but I ran into somebody, I'm out, I'm in Avery, Idaho and was, and took a turn down a road that, that ended up, this was last year, took a, took a turn down the road that was blocked and somebody was kind of flagging us down. And as soon as we pulled up, I could tell immediately that person recognized me and said, aren't you? And I'm like, I'm in Avery, Idaho. How does somebody recognize me from over there? So it is, uh, it is, it's kind of fun, but also a little bit unnerving when somebody recognizes you because the crazy thing about YouTube is that people get to know you on youtube right because i'm my authentic self when i'm on youtube but i've never met them right so they feel that they know me so there's this this level of comfort that they have with me that that i have to you know i have to remember right okay this this person feels like they know me so that's why they're being so 
forward, I guess you could say, because they've been watching me on YouTube. So it's been it's been kind of fun, but also a little bit like, wow, just kind of a, a, a different feeling to be to be recognized, of course, when I'm out, out on the river. But it's it's almost every time a positive react. I've only had one I would call a negative type of reaction. And it was in a particular fishery that's not fish very often. And I had my iPhone sitting on the chest. So that was the only uh the negative run that I have. But a lot of people <clears throat> a lot of people uh I don't maybe maybe it's because when they see me and I'm six foot seven and 235 pounds <laughs> people are like holy crap and they don't want to confront me so yeah that is one thing people maybe they're shocked at how tall i am <laughs> that's like that's like when we went out fishing because in your videos you only see like chest up right so you can't get an idea of how tall you are right but i went out fishing with you this summer when we made that that video and um i was just like Holy mackerel, you're way <laughs> taller than I expected. And I'm a pretty tall guy, too. I know. I was like, you towered over me. So, Yeah, that was, that was, uh, that was definitely a subject when I, was, uh, I spoke with the Puget Sound Fly Club, and they were just, like, like staring straight up at me. <laughs> you know, just like, holy crap, that super surprised look. And then there's me when Keaton and I met up. He was, like, looking down at me the whole time. <laughs> It's small, medium, and large right here. You know, we're just in the in order. Yeah, so. size fifteen waiting boot. Dang. I'm a thirteen. <laughs> I'm a they're like they're like giant. I mean, they're huge. It didn't even look like they should fit my feet. Wow. So, Dan is is YouTube your like? Is it a side gig right now? Is it a main job? Is there any any um, aspirations of becoming full gig or? You know, there always is that dream, right? When I first started, I had no idea, you know, trying to get my first 100 subscribers was, was a long process. And just, you know, putting out a video that you put all this energy and time in and getting 98 views. was. Like, <laughs> but again, the reason why I started, right, is I needed that positive distraction for myself. So who cares? And then when it started to grow and I became part of the YouTube partner program and all of a sudden now, you know, you get a little money for that. It's not a lot of money, right? It's it's people have a, a perception that you know YouTubers are making tons of money. They're not, so it's definitely a side gig. And the reason why I can manage it because I'm at my full time job right here, which takes takes a lot of time and energy, which I enjoy it. Um, my passion is fly fishing, and secondarily, right, is is creating these videos and creating content and inspiring others. So because I'm an empty nester now. You know, my, both well, my wife's son and my kids are out of the house and living their own lives. They're all in their twenties, allows me the time to do it. And a very supportive wife. I mean, she's, she has been instrumental of, of, of me being able to get where I'm at today and spend the time that I need to, to, to be able to make this, you know, a successful venture. But, you know, it does, it's, it's, it's kind of, a, it is a side gig today. You know, I've aligned, I've been very careful on who I align with. I've, it's amazing when you when you start to grow on YouTube, how many people start reaching out to you about, hey, you know, we'd like to send you some free gear. Hey, you know, we want you to, to represent this. Hey, we want you to represent that. Companies that I'd never heard of before. So I was super careful on who I decided to align with because, you know, I was developing this trust, right, on YouTube about being very open and honest about and candid about the gear that I use and what I think about them. I didn't want to align myself with anything I didn't believe in. So I've been super careful to align myself with companies that, that align, you know, with, with my philosophies and what I integrity and honesty and all those things. So I've, I've, uh, I have a couple of sponsorships that are from family owned companies. I also like doing that, right. Uh, supporting the family owned companies that check all those boxes. So, you know, today it's not a big earner. It, helps pay for gas and helps pay for a guided trip every once in a while or helps, uh, you know, pay for lodging when I go places type of thing. So it's, it's, uh, it's allowing this hobby not to be a super expensive, but I still, I still buy the majority of my gear, right? If I'm buying fly rods and fly reels and flies, I'm buying that most of the time. Um, so it's a pretty big investment, as you know, 
fly fishing. So it's kind of kind of nice to have something that's bringing in a little bit of income to be able to uh, pay for that. But you know, I have dreams that that uh, that maybe one day you know could really blow into something big. And I mean, how cool would it be to fly fish for a living? Seriously, I mean, no matter how good your regular job is, how cool would it be to fly fish for a living? I mean, that would be just tremendous. I couldn't. I, so that that would be that would be the dream, right? To be able to just do this for a living. But I'd need a, probably a few hundred thousand more subscribers, if not a couple million, and a couple, you know, and the brand deals to really start generating some income. Yeah, absolutely. So, what is it but like? I, I'll go, no, go ahead. Well, I, uh, the evolution, right? So, uh, pretty excited to to tell you guys. You'll be the first people to know. So, um, I just basically, I guess uh, you call it signed a deal, but I came to an agreement with Flywater Travel. I'm going to be a pro host, and oh, cool. uh, I'm going to I'm going to be hosting my first trip this year to the Bahamas. So, those are the kind of doors that this can open. Right. It's uh, uh, I'm super excited about it, but I, I just literally got off the phone. The guy that used to own the Puget Sound Fly Company, Anil, he now works for Flywater Travel and kind of put this in motion for me and talk to me about it. So I'm going to be doing my first hosted trip to Andros Island, Bahamas in December. So it's, those are the kind of really cool doors that that this journey can open up for me. Uh and I'm just super excited to, to be a part of their team and doing this with them. That's so cool. <laughs> what an exciting congratulations. Thanks. Yeah, it's super cool. I'm really excited about it. That's awesome. So hope I can fill the trip. <laughs> Otherwise, it won't be so exciting. Nah, I don't want to go, Dan. <laughs> yeah, no, let us know. We'll definitely uh, put links up to that so people can sign up if they want to go out with you. We'll for sure uh shout you out for that thanks yeah. uh, but today definitely definitely just a you know a passion that's turned you know called a a side gig or whatever but it's it's a it's a passion that in my free time i'm exploring and just just trying to trying to entrench myself in the industry in every way i can the fun parts yeah no that's awesome that's awesome so what is it like trying to manage then you know your personal life, but also your full-time job. And then, you know, I know, I, I know that it's not just the fishing part, right? It's the recording while you're fishing. It's the editing when you get back, it's the publishing on YouTube. How do you manage all of those things? And then, you know, working with partner companies, how do you work them into your videos and when you're creating content? So it's a process and I've gotten pretty good at it now that I've been doing this for about three years. So I've learned how to better film so I will film in two to three minute increments. And if nothing exciting happens in that moment, I'll just delete it. So the only footage that I'll come back with, generally I'll come back with 50 to 100 clips. They're all something though, whether it's B-roll or I caught a fish or I said something or did something that might be interesting. So it's already pre-packaged during filming and I, and I have an idea of where I want to go. I also can film two to five videos per trip so people have the perception that I fish all the time, but I, I do fish a lot, but I don't fish all the time. I can build two, three, four videos out of one trip and then release them over a period of two weeks, right? To keep content rolling on YouTube, because that's how you, that's how you become successful on YouTube is having consistent uploads and good content. Um, and then when I get home, I've gotten really proficient at, I use a software called Filmora and um, very proficient. So I can, I can whip out a eight minute video in a couple of hours because there's not a lot of fancy stuff that I do within it. It's generally all point, you know, my perspective POV type filming. So it's just building a visual story along the way, you know, um, in with some of the selfie shots that I do explaining what I'm doing some, I do a little bit of uh, narration over some clips as well, but I can put together a trip really in just a few hours after fishing. So there's definitely an investment in time. Um, you know, Monday through Friday, I'm pretty committed to what I'm doing 
right here. That's the week. I'm a weekend warrior. So usually I, res I reserve a day to go fishing and then I'll reserve a day to, to do the edits. And again, circling back to a very supportive wife. She, you know, she supports me in the time that it takes to do that. But of course I, uh, I make sure I have a healthy balance between, um, personal life outside of YouTube, personal passion of YouTube and fly fishing and sharing my passion and obligations of work. So I've, I've been able to find that, that balance. And it's certainly helped. I don't feel as much pressure now that I can film four or five videos out of one trip, right? I, I might not fish for two weeks, but you'd never know it on YouTube. Yeah. Like right now I have probably two and a half weeks of videos in the queue that's still ready to be launched. Cool. That's rad. And I would, I mean, I've dabbled in YouTube a little bit, not, not a lot. And I would, I would assume, you know, having that stuff in the queue is going to help you to stay, you know, like revelant in like YouTube, YouTube algorithms to try to bring up your, your views, right. On your videos. Yeah. The biggest, um, the biggest piece of YouTube that I've been able to su successful, successfully leverage is YouTube shorts. So they're similar to Instagram reels. I got in pretty early with the understanding that YouTube shorts could really help with the channel's growth. So I started just filming and uploading a lot of short clips. In fact, I went on a, in the beginning of the, of last year, I went on a strategic mission of uploading at least five shorts a week. And now the YouTube algorithm understands that, that I produce some engaging fishing shorts and I'll, I'll get a lot of views on the shorts, which then helps with my discoverability and reach. It doesn't do anything monetarily, but it, it helps with the channel growth. And so people that typically may not have been suggested my video on their homepage or, or found it if they search fly fishing might discover my content with a, the short and realize, oh, and I get that all the time. Right? I can't believe I haven't found your channel. This is so great. And they discovered it through a short. So I've been able to, to leverage that piece of, of YouTube that YouTube is putting a ton of resources in to grow because they, of course, want to squash TikTok and Instagram and and uh, and be the leader in short form content. So I was discovered that earlier on, early on, and it certainly helped with the channel's growth. Yeah. So like being on YouTube, um, is there a, a level of competition on YouTube? Do you find yourself like trying to uh, go back and forth those other channels? Or do you feel like the YouTube, um, like your other fellow YouTubers are pretty supportive of like each other? Uh, so there is a level of competition, but um, I've taken a different approach and that's collaboration. So not, not a lot of other creators you know, you have to you have to build some trust on the platform before another creator would acknowledge you, because there are a lot of there are a lot of folks on YouTube trying to be successful, and I think a lot of a lot of other people potentially could be it could be more self serving, right? Like they they want to collaborate with some big creators, but yet they're not putting real energy into their own YouTube channels. So I've taken the approach of not. I mean, they're, they're considered my competitors, but I don't consider them my competitors. Like I've had some recent interaction with John Hardman from Hardman Fishing Adventures. In fact, one of the videos that are in the queue, I'm going to give him a big shout out because I was inspired after watching one of his videos on a setup that he bought in Walmart about how I can continue that message. So I gave him a shout out pointing to his video. He has no idea that's coming, by the way. So it'll be a surprise to him, but I've interacted a little bit with him on on Facebook and he had mentioned that, oh yeah, your videos get recommended to me all the time. So I, I could see that he he'll definitely be a, a collaborator one day. Um one of the one of the toughest bridges to build is with the huge fly fisherman, but I've I re recently had some interaction with Ben. Great guy, great channel, far different than mine, right? It's definitely the snarkier side of fly fishing, but he has a he has built some great content and has really worked hard to build what he's built. And I look forward to one day doing more things with Ben. And he actually recently gave me a shout out on a, he did a live question and answer. And I happened to be in on the chat and watching it. And I asked him a question about hosting, right? I, I needed some 
advice for him uh, from him about hosting. And he then sent me an email with this really just outlined, here's all the things that I learned about hosting trips. And he is the reason why I was able to land the deal with fly, fly water travel, hundred percent of his coaching. He didn't need to take that time and energy to do that for me, but you know, I had been interacting with him a little bit on and off with the channel and posed a good question on one of his live chats and he offered to, you know, shoot me an email and, and uh, I'll tell you a little bit about it. He wrote me this paragraph of all of the pitfalls and challenges and things he learned along the way, which helped me in uh, what happened with fly router travel. It wasn't for his collaboration. I would have never, I wouldn't have been able to do it as quickly as I've done it. So I've always considered other creators, right? Because I know how much work goes in to building a successful YouTube channel that um, I have a lot of respect for others that, that put in that hustle and time and energy. So it's, I'm now building a lot of, uh, uh, collaborations with these people and maybe one day even friendships. That's right. Yeah. I mean, I feel like it's, <clears throat> and I look at it the very same way with, um, fellow podcasts, right? You can only, everybody, um, can only help themselves right to get better you, it's you grow more when you work together as opposed to working against each other yeah i uh, agree wholeheartedly yeah well i was gonna i was gonna add on to that too is it's pretty crazy how uh when you like necessarily offer kindness and like welcome kind of attitude how uh people will reciprocate that back to you a lot of the time and it it's been really cool to be like part of this uh building this podcast and I'm, I'm sure you feel the same way about your YouTube channel and having, you know, people just random people reach out and be like, Hey, I love your podcast. We'll give you a shout out on our podcast. And like, you didn't even ask, they just do it. And then you're like, wow, I really like these. You share their stuff and then you're building a friendship and you get to invite it on other podcasts and stuff as well. So just, just a really cool uh, atmosphere to be in they you wouldn't expect yeah totally and it's uh you know if it and if it happens organically like that that's what it's really it's it's pretty cool right and uh i see that too on youtube if creators want to help other creators be successful and i've had some smaller channels reach out to me and ask me for advice and, and i have no problem right i'm not i don't feel just because my channel is now almost thirty thousand subscribers oh i'm not going to talk to somebody with only 500 you know, I was there not there long ago and, and got some great tips on some bigger YouTubers and creators to help me grow my channel. So I want to extend that same kindness that other people have showed me along the way to help them with, with their journey too, if they want to, if they want to put in the time and energy to be successful on the platform. That's awesome. Yeah. Pay it forward. Yeah. Right. Bring about what you think about all those things, right? It's a, uh, I'm a firm believer in karma. Good karma. Yeah. You want to build that up in the bank because you yep. never know when you're going to need it. Yep. So Dan, I, I, I know you mentioned it um, before. And, and of course you mentioned that you're going to be hosting trips, but do you get to travel much for your videos or do you tend to stick more around Pacific Northwest or do you aspire again to travel more in the future for YouTube? So today it uh, it's, it's usually state to state. So I, I travel, I have um, yearly fishing licenses for Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Montana. So I do a lot of my fishing in those states because today I don't have a ton of vacation time. So I have to be kind of the weekend warrior. And a lot of my vacation, I'll just butt up against a weekend so I can go, you know, to one of my favorite new spots or Eastern Oregon or fish in Montana. I have a lot of places that I visit in Montana and Idaho and even in Washington. Um, so today it's, it's pretty local. I do, I found a passion though, for tropical fly fishing happened when I was 25 years old. My dad bought me a trip to Christmas Island for my 25th birthday. And he and I went to Christmas Island and caught bonefish and giant trevally on a fly rod. And I realized I'm not cold, right? These fish are nuts when they, when they fight, it's nuts. Like. I don't know if you've ever caught a bonefish. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> Imagine <laughs> casting at a jet ski going by and then trying to stop it. I mean, that's that's what it's like catching a bonefish. So, you know, trout occasionally give you a nice run, but the bonefish a lot of times won't stop until there's no backing left. So it's it's just not it's nuts, right? So I I found this passion for for tropical fly fishing, and now since the pandemic, I've been going nuts because I haven't done it. I I would go to Hawaii at least once a year. Uh, my wife and I go to Maui and I know some secret spots for giant bonefish and have garnered a lot of success. I figured it out in, in, in Hawaii. So I would love to, to do some other videos outside of the Pacific Northwest, but right now it's just a matter of finding time to be able to do that. And that hosted trip. And uh, part of the reason why I chose bone fishing is because I know it. I've had a lot of success with bone fishing. I've been doing it for over 25 years and you know feels very familiar and comfortable um, i don't know if i call myself a bonefish expert but i've certainly figured out how to catch them anywhere i go and yeah i mean i think if my dream were to come true kyle and this became a living i would be doing a ton of fishing in the pacific northwest but i'd be going to warm sp- uh, destinations often i dig it i did so- get up to alaska i did do that about a year and a half ago which was amazing little diy trip and found a creek that was loaded full of giant trout it's pretty crazy and grayling yeah they're uh surprisingly it's surprising what um little bodies of water up here hold uh, hold fish pretty incredible stuff it is so what does um you know your a weekend trip can you break down what that might look like, you know, planning wise, um, your trip heading over there or, or heading wherever you're going. Um, and then like, how does the filming work into that? Like, can you break down from the moment you, you think about a place you want to go film to, you know, getting that up on to YouTube after that trip has been filmed and edited and produced? A lot of times, a lot of my trips are spontaneous, like the one with Keaton. Uh, that was completely spontaneous and just, I mean, no time to plan, right? I just brought the camera. I asked Keaton, I said, do you mind if I do a little filming? And I brought the camera along. And in the moment is when it just evolves, right? Uh, And that, I didn't go with the plan at all. Some of my trips, I've taken some couple of day trips. And in my mind, I'll be thinking about things that I might want to do. But a lot of times, most of the time, it evolves in the trip itself. Um, you know, as I'm as I'm filming, I will capture moments and keep them, you know, saved on the iPhone that I think might be interesting for later, and delete the ones that I don't. And part of part of I think the appeal that I have on on my channel is that it is authentic and organic, and I don't really plan anything. I mean, there's occasionally if I sit down and I'm talking about a certain strategy or I'm doing a casting video or trying to help somebody out there, that's more planned. But when I'm fishing, it's just me fishing and taking things as they come and trying to capture that in the moment Uh, and i get really excited when i'm done to be able to to go back into the editing room and and download everything off my iphone and put it into the editing software and begin to tell the story i mean i'm to the point to where it's almost obsessive where i cannot wait to tell the story i mean fishing's first but a close second is is in the editing room telling the story I love putting a little bit of music behind it, you know, to try to catch a vibe. And um, yeah, it's, I really enjoy that storytelling process. But much of that is unplanned, spontaneous, organic, and evolves as the day evolves. But my process is to film everything on a chest mount, mostly. You know, I do whenever I'm talking to the camera. I'm, what's also helped, too, is I feel like I'm talking to the person that's watching the video. Right. And that's helped a ton with perspective and feeling comfortable on camera is it's no different than me talking to you right now. That's the I'm talking to another that one person that decided to click on my video. I'm going to talk to that person. And and then during the day, it, it evolves and I come home and downloaded all my computer. And sometimes I'm up until midnight, you know, doing the doing the editing because I cannot wait just to kind of get what's up here on in the editor room and on film, but a lot of times it's the next day when it's all done and finished up and uploaded to YouTube. And then 
then of course, there's things you have to do for search optimization, right? I want it to be, you know, I want to be able to capture the moment or the story in a good title. So there's, there's some behind the scenes things that you have to do as well, because when you consider there are, I don't know how many, I, I looked at the stat once, how many billions of videos that are on YouTube, like it's in the billions, like how many, how many videos do you look at in one session, right? When you're, when you're thumbing up, you might look at maybe 50 thumbnails yeah. of billions that are on YouTube. So you have to have a thumbnail that's intriguing, a title that's intriguing, so that somebody give, even gives you the chance to be able to tell the story by clicking on your video. Then you need to deliver right away, right? So there, I've learned through James, right, that, that who taught me some of the editing stories to create a hook right to where somebody might see a big fish cod and then i cut just before i net it so it brings intrigue oh i can't wait to see what what he caught or that tip that he wanted to talk about so there's definitely a strategy on how to tell a good story to keep people engaged uh on your video yeah wow i never <laughs> really thought of it like that you know yeah i mean you have to you know it may be the greatest story ever but if you don't have a good cover on that book nobody wants nobody will read it yeah. So is there certain things that you have to do behind the camera to give your make yourself, you know, not sounds like sleepy or uh, make yourself appear like, you know, exciting? Do you do anything of, of that sort? No, I think uh, I think after you fish with me, Keaton, you, you can see that my my energy is pretty much like it is when I'm fishing. So. <laughs> You know, I get pretty jazzed up when I, when I catch a fish and when I'm out there because I'm in my place, right? It's, I don't know. I mean, you, you probably know it's, it's a spiritual thing for me almost, you know, when I'm in my element. Part of what I love about fly fishing is that's all I think about. So what I found is that translates on film. When I'm, when I'm just generally speaking, you do have to bring a level of energy, right, that you would have, Um uh, so that you don't sound boring. So I'm just very much like in what's helped me in the beginning. When I first started, I was talking to my my phone and it came across that way. As soon as I was able to mentally picture you on the other side of that camera and I'm talking to you and I'm talking to Kyle, when I'm doing, that's when it all changed, right? Because now I sound like I am right now talking with you on camera because I'm visualizing that person that took the time to click on the video and watch it. So I'm going to talk to that person like they're standing right in front of me. That's awesome. And that's when it's, when it all changed. But the, uh, some of the people have asked me before, you know, they, they like, does he really get that excited about fish? I recently had a, I had a, a, a piece of short content go viral recently. And um, a lot of the comments are, why is he breathing so hard? How can he show breathing so hard? He's out of shape. You know, less cake, more fishing, you know, type of thing. A lot of those kind of comments. But I'm thinking it's just adrenaline, right? And when, I, when I saw those three big fish cruising the shore and I was sitting back eating lunch and I immediately grabbed my fly rod and I'm trying to pull out line and get, get it so I can, before they get past, yeah. I mean, that that energy and that enthusiasm and, is real. And comes and thankfully it comes across on film yeah you know i that's like i was just trying to kind of talk about the tip that you're like you know you got to kind of pronounce a little louder but truly you are like that way you're just excited to be out there excited to be fishing so if anyone has any doubts about fly fish dan here <laughs> i can prove to you that the don't doubt it at all that's just who he is well, thank you. But occasionally I have to edit out. I, I mispronunciate something or, you know, I have, uh, I'll have brain farts along the way that I have to edit out as I'm talking about something that, that'll happen. But I, but I found that I'm more fluid now that I'm more comfortable, uh, and change that mindset. I'm more fluid, but I still misspeak like we all do and, you know, mispronounce words or whatever else that happens. Yeah. But fortunately, by the power of editing, you just cut that out exactly it never I mean, <laughs> it never happened exactly the thing you got to remember too just like what happens on youtube videos or or podcasts or wherever is like we're people you know i think people with 
get caught up and everything has to be perfect but like people are going to stutter when they're excited about something or they're going to trip over words when they're trying to explain a long thing and it's like it's just the way it is i mean i know a lot of people that do it so and that's a good point and part of and part of my evolution in these videos as well is i used to cut out when I snagged the bottom, snagged the tree, hit myself, tangled the line, all the things that happened, I'd edit that out. And I realized, you know, that's not real. So I started to put some of those situations in my videos and people are like thanking me saying, you know what? Thanks for showing the not so glamorous side of fly fishing as well. Because even though I've been doing it forever, I'll still get fly strikes or cast my entire nymph dropper setup on top of my indicator, things like that. And, yeah. and it's real, right? That's that's what happens when you fly fish. In fact, I have enough footage I could probably put together a pretty good gag reel. I did one trip on a. I was in Oregon fishing uh, fishing one of the uh, Cascade rivers, and I didn't catch a fish, but I lost more flies and tangled up more setups. I ended up launching the video anyway because it's just me beeping out all the swear words and everything else. Because I literally caught nothing but trees, rocks, logs the entire trip. But when I launched it, it was a real popular video just because people were like, ah, it doesn't happen just to me. It even happens to somebody that fishes all the time, like myself. Being pure. Yeah. I mean, I, I went out fishing for the first time in a few months and I was like, it, that first couple casts to get yourself going again, I was like, oh my gosh, I would, you know, I, I would have thought I'd never fished before. And then finally I kind of got the rhythm of things, but um, it's, it just, it's just that it happens to the best of us. Yep. Well, and I, I think too that's that's a big thing about your platform, right? On YouTube, that's why I go to YouTube because you know when it comes to let's say like Sportsman's Channel or the Outdoor Channel, or whatever those people, you know, in a half hour they have what in reality twenty two minutes that so they have to cram everything in, right? So you're only seeing those highlights. You're not seeing all that extra stuff. Whereas when you're able to put it into your own form and you're able to edit it how you want it, you can add that stuff that makes it more realistic, right? The the raw, the real stuff where you don't have that 22 minutes, you got to cram all the good stuff in. You're actually able to show the whole experience and it, it just feels more realistic for the viewer. It's not 22 minutes of a you catching fish and never getting tangled or never losing a fish. Or, you know, when it comes to hunting, you know, it's just, I'm hunting, I hunted, kill shot, done, right? It, you actually get to experience all those other things in between. And all the work and all the frustration that sometimes can happen along the way. But I think it's important to show that too, because it isn't, you know, it's always fun, but there's definitely challenges along the way. And I think it's important, especially for anybody that's new to fly fishing, to understand, you know, and I'm, I'm thinking of a video idea even now, like, you know, it's okay to fail because you're going to, and it's okay. And because you're going to be able to, make the cast the next time or catch the fish the next time or the next time the fish won't come unhooked or unbuttoned and it's okay it's okay to fail because we all do it even me after fly fishing since i was 16 years old i still fail yep. and it's okay and that's how you learn right and yep. relearn. i mean those are lessons that we may have learned at one time but you got to relearn them again because you're like it's just a reminder like oh this this stuff does happen here i need to be able to you know, remember this, what did I do? What, how do I fix it? What did I do to fix it? And I think that's just being human. Yeah. I'm still growing today in fly fishing. I mean, I'm still learning new things today. And part of this YouTube journey as well, it's opened me up to, to discovering new places. Um, I don't always go to the same place where I know I'm going to catch a fish. So they call it like blue lining or, or finding new places to fish. It's inspired me to do that. And I'm, and I've learned a lot of things along along the way as well about fishing different fisheries and different places and different climates and even my own casting. I've, I've improved my casting in the last three years after doing tutorials because I noticed after watching some of my videos, I was opening my wrist in the back cast. So I'm more conscious of that. So it's 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 having the realization that if, if you're willing and able to grow in the sport at every year and every year you're involved in every level is where you'll continue to improve. And I think by showing that and admitting that when I, when I can do something better, I think is a powerful thing um, to teach somebody who's new, right? Cause you're never going to be perfect ever. Yeah. And it's okay. Uh, yeah. I think it's an, I think that's what makes you real authentic. Um, 
I I tell clients before every trip, you know, it's exactly the same thing. Like I may have been doing this for a while, um, but I'm always learning and I'm always learning, especially from new people, um, like people with new perspectives. Um, you know, I'll, I'll learn a lot of stuff from clients that have never even fly fish before in their life. And, um, just the way they're approaching it, the way their perspectives are, I might not be learning how to fly fish from those people, but I'm learning how to address maybe that the, the viewpoint that they're, um, or their perspective that they're coming into fishing and fly fishing from maybe how to interact with a certain type of person or just to, you know, enjoy the experience, how they're enjoying the experience. Maybe it's, maybe it's not how I have been, have been viewing fly fishing or been viewing my guide trips, but the way that they're experiencing it, the way they're enjoying their trip kind of opens my eyes. So I, I, I just think there's so many different ways and so many different types of people to learn from. Yeah, I mean, with uh, Kobe, my stepson, which has been in several of my videos, I'm I learned I taught him how to fly fish five or six years ago, and I'm learning things from him today because um, he he can be I don't know what the word is whether it's a visionary or he he thinks outside the box when it comes to fly fishing, especially with somebody like myself that have been doing it for so long. There's certain things that we know that's going to work, right? And we stick to those certain things. He is really good at finding new ways to catch fish and there was a recent trip and i don't want to hot spot this particular lake but there was a recent trip to a lake that was there was never there was never any chance that, a, that you can catch a, one of these lahatan cutthroat on a dry fly well after his indicator got eaten a couple of times you know because i always do you catch lahatan cutthroat either on a sinking line or you have to have an indicator and something down below they'll never eat a dry that's a fluke he tied on a Chernobyl ant. And I said, well, you better, better tie on a dropper on that if you're going to catch fish. And we ended up having one of the most epic two days of dry fly fishing for La Hot and Cutthroat, sight fishing on a lake. And I mean, and I would have never thought of thinking that far outside the box of what I think would work or wouldn't work because that's what I've been doing for decades. And because he just has a younger mind and you know, wants to try new things. He has garnered, I mean, there are a lot of times where I'm like, hey, Kobe, what, what are you using? <laughs> Do you have another one of those gummy midges in your box or, you know, one of those dry flies in your box? Because he he's figured it out, right? And I'm I'm learning from him now because he he's not prone to the same habits that, that I might have been in for the decades that I've been fly fishing. So, and that's one thing I, I think, uh, when you can bring in you know new people into this sport it's going to it's evolves right you can grow and learn from people that have just started like you were saying right because it, it opens you up to different perspectives of what potentially could work or not work or find success right so it's pretty cool so i have a question for you so you're getting ready for to go on a trip or on a guide trip how do you what do you do to combat expectations, right? Because I'm sure that you go out, you're hoping that you're, you know, especially when you're recording videos, you're like, I want to catch fish. I need to catch fish for content. Not, I mean, not always necessarily, but it's always, you know, it's more beneficial to catch fish on a video. What do you do like uh, necessarily to kind of like get your mind right instead of having like high expectations, right? Does that, does that no. make sense? It does. Um, um, I don't want this, you know, I don't want this to sound. I'm trying to figure out how to articulate this. I don't often get skunked. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that that's because um, I'm this great fly fisherman or great fisherman. Um, I generally find success, so I don't feel pressure. I, I um, find ways to catch fish, right? It's, I'll probably go through. 20 different flies before I can figure it out. And yeah. kind of like we talked about earlier, right? A lot of fly fishing is very similar from place to place you go. And there's certain tactics that work better in other places, but generally, right. There's a, there's a large book of tactics that will work in most places. Mm -hmm. And I generally catch fish. There's, it hasn't been often where I've been completely blank. So I don't feel pressure. Um, 
because I generally find success when it comes to catching fish. So that pressure isn't there for me. Now, there are times that I've gone out and I haven't caught anything. And that's okay, right? Either, you know, I have a couple of videos where I, you know, I fish year round that I just, you know, it's wintertime and just being out here and enjoying the outdoors and fish catching a fish is a bonus, right? So I try to pass that message along as well when I have a slow day or if I don't catch any fish, or maybe it turns into something tutorial that I'll do. Again, part of being authentic and real, right? I don't want to paint a picture that every time I go out, I'm catching fish after fish after fish after fish after fish. I want to paint a real perspective of, you know, there are days that I might just catch one um, or there's days that, that I may not catch any and that's okay. Yeah. The, I did feel pressure though, this weekend, I felt a little pressure because I was working on that video series, the Walmart, I'm doing a Walmart, you know, you can catch a fish with a fly rod for $72 and I needed to get a fish in the net and I was having a hard time with that. So, uh, uh, Kobe and I went fishing at a local lake and he caught fish. I, I had one hook, we couldn't land it. So then I thought, you know, I'm going to go to this lake that I know it's going to be money, right? I need now on, now I'm there because I need to get, uh, I need to put a fish in the net with this fly rod set up from Walmart. And I worked five hours to catch that one fish. So I started to feel a little bit of pressure when I had a couple that, you know, came, came off as I couldn't get them into the net. I was like, geez, I got two hours left to light. So there are times, right, that, that I needed to put a fish in the net with this particular fly rod, which, as you know, could be tough in the wintertime. Um, so that was that was one recent time that I felt a little bit of pressure. But generally, um, I'll, fi I'll, find, I'll find a way to catch them. So yeah. I don't typically feel like i need to um um you know i don't go in with that mindset right um i i'm a firm believe believer of you know we talked about good karma you know you bring about what you think about i go in with the attitude that i'm i'm going to catch something cool today and i've caught some amazing fish just because i'm putting that out there in the universe that makes yeah. sense no, it does. That's great. It totally makes sense. Um, I think that's uh, something that I I try to do as well. And it, as a um, as a guide with and having clients and being able to do that with clients, um, was something I noticed in the last couple of years. You know, those fish feed off of good vibes. I I feel like, and if I'm starting to get stressed. Maybe we haven't caught enough. Maybe we haven't caught our first fish. I haven't put a fish in the net or, you know, maybe the client isn't, um, is so focused on catching a <laughs> fish or a bunch of fish that sometimes you kind of have to pull yourself back, kind of rein them back. Like, Hey, it's more about the experience. Like, we're just having a good time. We're just being chill. It seems like the moment that you start putting off those good confident vibes is that's when things start to happen. Like um, a couple of days ago, you know, we were uh, my wife and I were ice fishing here in Anchorage. We had some friends meet us at the lake and I was a little stressed out. Right. Cause I'm, they've never ice fished. So I'm, I'm showing them and I haven't been fishing in a while. Cause I just got back from a trip and I'm trying to like rig up rods and set things up. And then, they're just, I don't know if they had any expectations. There's dogs running around. And I'm like, oh man, there's so much going on. The fishing sucked. And I and as they were leaving, I I talked to my wife. I'm like, the moment they leave, nothing against them, but the moment that they left, and I told her, like, the moment that they leave, the fishing's gonna get better. Cause I knew that they'd be feeding off of, you know, my vibes. I'm not stressed. I mean, I'm, I'm confident we're going to catch fish. And it's what happened is the moment they left is like the fishing. I don't know if the fishing just turned on or what, but I think a lot of it had to f deal with those good vibes that I was like putting out there. And it's like, boom, boom, boom. After that, the fish just started biting. And I think it was because of, I'm not stressed. Um, maybe their expectations were not being met. So they weren't having a good time. They're not used to it. They're cold. There's a lot of different factors that go into it, but yeah. The good vibes, the confidence, I think really, really helps. Well, I can't agree with you more. And I have, I have a story to, to back up your story as well. And this is recent. I was at Pyramid Lake. And everyone knows Pyramid Lake. So I'm at yeah. Pyramid Lake. And I wasn't getting frustrated because I wasn't catching any fish for content. 
I was getting frustrated because I wasn't catching any fish, right? I'm there because when that indicator goes down, it could be a 10, 15, 20 pound lot and cutthroat trout. And I was out there just get beat up by the wind and the cold and standing on that ladder and waiting for a fish. I lost a couple, I had a couple of takedowns that I missed, a couple of long releases, you know, others were catching fish and I was getting frustrated. So I went back to the trailer. My wife went with me on this trip and, you know, she could tell I was frazzled, right? It was just like frustrated because I was so amped up about catching one of these fish. We just got there. Um, and she literally came out of the trailer and said, you know, your energy is all wrong. You need to, you need to reset, reset, right? Calm me down, talk me through it. Uh, you know, we're camping. I took a, I I took a shot, shot of vodka, calm me down. And I went back out there and I caught five that were between eight and 12 pounds because I went out there with a different attitude, went to the same ladder, did the same thing brought a different attitude, brought a different level of confidence and completely changed my own vibe. And I caught, and no kidding, five fish that were that big within a two hour span of having that conversation with my wife who calmed me down and just said, just, just chill out, right? Change the energy. And it completely changed the experience. I 100% believe that. Yeah. I know a lot of the times I'm just going to add a story in here too. I know a lot of the times that you're out, you know, I'm out fishing with clients that if like towards my beginning days, I'd be like getting stressed out. Like, Oh my gosh, I'm not catching fish. These people hate money. Like blah, blah, blah. I'm forgetting about the whole experience. Like Kyle was saying, but then when I realized like, you know, clients will get frustrated here and there because they'll miss a fish or especially when you're trying to get that first fish into the boat and it may be taking a little bit longer that day. And uh, you just, I've just realized that if you, you keep saying it, it's okay, there's going to be a next one, you know, keep at it, keep the positive vibes going, just get insane, just chill. Like you just got to be laid back. Right. Cause the second you start getting stressed out, people feed on that. People are yep. like, oh my gosh, like the guide's stressed out. So something must be not right. And I, oh my gosh, and blah, 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 blah. And so then everyone's like, ah. And it becomes like a house on fire and there's nothing to do because you're in a boat and you still got six hours to float with people. So <laughs> just like that laid back vibe. And even if it takes five hours to catch that first fish, there's always going to be more opportunities. Yeah. Good story. So Dan, um, we've been talking about your background, um, YouTube channel and, um, you know, your trips and, and just, just kind of covering the whole gamut. Where do you see yourself, you know, in five years from now, both you personally, um, in the, in the industry and then, you know, your YouTube channel. You know, I honestly, Kyle, I don't have a plan. This is, a, it's, I would have never envisioned myself where I'm at today. So who knows where I, where it could be in five years. I mean, I know, I know I'm going to stick to this, um, I know that, you know, there's always something to talk about and fly fishing and I'll continue to make content because I really enjoy it myself. Um, you know, I'll continue to align with, with brands that, um, support me and that I believe in, um, you know, I have a great relationship and building a great relationship with a new company out of Bellingham, Washington drift waiters, family owned company, great company, great product, great everything, right? It's, I envision, you know, partnering, partnering up with companies like nick's company and drift um and who knows where that could evolve right this doing my first hosted trip in december seems like forever from now but you know the people that you meet along the way right that's some of the coolest thing who knows who i'm going to run into and what relationship i might forge along the way that could lead to different things so i've i've just kind of i've kind of gone through this and hate using the word but journey right this whole this whole journey that i'm on and social media and just kind of letting it, it evolve by itself and it's been nothing but positive it's been nothing but meeting these meeting people these great people and and it is i mean it's a little bit of heavy responsibility sometimes when you have the impact on people um you know it's it's it, but it also is fulfilling to be able to reach people like that so i want to continue to inspire people to get out there i want to continue to 
inspire people that can't get out there anymore that just enjoy watching fly fishing content and remembering back when you know i want to um i want to put as much positive energy out there in the universe as i possibly can and into this sport and that's what i'm going to continue to do and where it kind of goes from there you know just kind of let those doors come and and kind of like what we talked about before right you bring about what you think about if you just keep putting kindness out there and you keep spreading a positive message um i just think good things will happen right so and they'll just organically happen one of the coolest things that i've done recently um it's so much fun to watch people's reaction i got this if you watch a lot of YouTube, everyone knows who Mr. Beast is, right? He's a philanthropist. And I thought, of why, why can't I do a little bit of that on my channel? So I partnered up with a couple of companies and I just started randomly handing out fly boxes from, from Red's Flies, who's another family owned company out of Georgia. And just walking up to people and just say, you know what? I'm just going to, I'm going to give you a box of flies today just because, right? And, and to watch people's reaction. And one of the coolest stories happened to where, you know, people are always kind of a little bit leery, right? So I try to find timing when I go up to somebody because I don't want to just charge up on somebody. Hey, I got something for you. You know, I I approached, it was Kobe and I were fishing a, a local lake and approached a guy and just started to talk a little bit. And I said, hey, I got a box of flies for you. He goes like, what? He goes, yeah. Well, why? So, you know, spreading random acts of kindness, right? On, on, on the internet, putting positive vibes out there and, and thank you for being a part of it and handing him a box of flies. And he was just floored by that. And then he rose back over about an hour later and he's like, you're not going to believe it. I just tied on that big black fly and caught the biggest cutthroat I've ever caught. I've been fishing this lake for 20 years and I just caught a 24 inch cutthroat trout, my personal best. And it was on the fly that I gave him <laughs> randomly uh, that he caught it on. It's stuff like that, right? That, fuels me right that's the fuels my wanting to continue to do that right if i can if i can make an impact like that in somebody's life in a very positive way that's it makes certainly makes me feel good and and um yeah just to be able to spread kindness to random strangers when you i mean talk about all the some of the negativity right that that's out there as well to try to try to combat that with a with a bunch of positive energy that's that's what i'm just going to continue to do yeah that's great yeah so we covered a lot of stuff i mean you you've talked about everything is there anything else that you wanted to add that we didn't uh, didn't cover or you didn't you know you just wanted to share or any message anything of that sort well i think um you know trying to inspire others that want to try it again it's kind of what we if we just kind of wrap up everything that we just talked about, about, you know, fly, fly fishing is, is I think if somebody decides it's listening to this, it might be considering getting into fly fishing, but you don't have to put away the spin gear forever or the traditional gear. Right. But get a fly rod. And I think you're going to find that there's, there's just a, it's a, it's a different experience. I don't know. It's, when I first, I loved fishing my entire life, right? I was fishing all the way until 16 with traditional gear. As soon as I got a fly rod, things just changed. It's hard to describe, but the feel, the the entire experience just changes. It evolves. So I would encourage anybody that's thinking about it, do it. There are, there are ways to get into fly fishing where you don't have to spend a ton of money. You know, all you need is a rod, a reel, some line, a box of flies, stick it in your pocket, go to your local lake, go to your local stream, and try it out right you don't even know need to know how to cast 40 50 feet just get the line out there far enough where a fish can eat it and that's it right and, and don't be afraid right afraid to fail right we're all growing including myself we've been doing it forever we're all growing in the sport don't be afraid to try it and if you try it i can almost assure you you're gonna love it right it's you're just going to become obsessed with it like we all are on, on this podcast right now so that would be my message is, is to is to you know for anyone look looking to get into it is to encourage them to do it and and to take the leap because it's it's worth it and be kind be kind to one another that's a that's a big one right so pay it forward well with that um we appreciate that dan um we appreciate everything that you've shared with us. Uh, we like to 
end our podcast with a little bit of a rapid fire round, ask you some some questions to get to know a little bit more about Dan. And um, yeah, Keaton, anything else to add before we get into it? Um, no, just our we got a few more questions to ask you with our rapid fire. Uh, another question at the end, and then we'll do our exit. So, all right, all right, Keaton. All right, kick us off. Here we go. Rapid fire round, Dan. What right. is your favorite fish to fish for? Uh, cutthroat. Cutthroat trout. Is there a specific species of cutthroat, or just any cutthroat? Uh, any cutthroat because they're just they just eat everything, <laughs> and they're <laughs> sluggers. They're fun to catch, and you know, if there's an easy trout to catch, it's generally a cutthroat because you throw something in front of their face, they're going to eat it. So Lahatans have been on my mind recently just because they get so ridiculously giant and they're gorgeous fish. And to also know that you're catching kind of a an ancient species of fish is pretty cool. So cutthroat have been on my mind lately and more specifically Lahatan cutthroat. I'm trying to find new places to fish for them because they, they're not found in very many parts of the world. Yeah, that's Sweet. cool. Close second is bonefish, but it's been a long time since I caught one of those. <laughs> What's a dream destination for you to fish? A dream destination would be Belize. Nice. Love to go there. All right. You're going out. You're hitting the water. What is your favorite like snack and beverage to take out while you're fishing? Uh, adult beverage or... <laughs> We can do adult. Let's do an adult beverage, and then let's do like a just like a drinking beverage. All right. So my adult beverage is uh, an IPA. I love a really good hoppy IPA. So I'm always got a uh, IPA. In fact, I even started a series, Fly Gear and Beers, as I was trying out new local IPAs. I love the IPA, and I love bringing it along. Um, you know, other than that, it's uh, I try to stay hydrated. So if I'm not drinking an IPA, I'm drinking a lot of water. So yeah. I don't necessarily bring, you know, sodas or anything else like that. Cause you're usually loaded full of tons of sugar and everything else. But so it's, it's, I know it's boring, but that's the honest truth. I'm drinking water or I'm drinking an IPA. Sometimes I might have a screwdriver, you know, if I'm camping and I've got my little Yeti, you know, thing that you hear dangling off my waiting belt. That's usually vodka, orange juice and that if I'm yeah. camping. So, <laughs> and my favorite snack is, uh, you know, I'm, I, I really enjoy the baked lays. In fact, that's what I've been snacking on today. <laughs> today, I just I can pretty much erase an entire bag of baked lays in in a sitting. <laughs> Love it. I've hey. also been known to eat an entire brick of graham crackers in one sitting too. Graham crackers are a good one and just good to have out. Good energy source. <laughs> You got to have that sweet and or and or savory things out there on the water. I found that that really helps you get through your day. Yeah, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches are my big go to when it comes to packing, mostly because I'm lazy and they're easy to make, and they taste great. And they do taste great, especially the Puyallup Farms raspberry jelly. So good. That sounds oh, good. We'll have to try that. All right, Dan. What are you listening to when you're driving to your destination? You know, it's interesting you say that. I have a lot of different playlists, and it's generally um, upbeat kind of music that gets me energized, right? Sometimes I put on 80s rock. Sometimes it's just 80s. Sometimes it's metal, right? I'm putting some Metallica on there, and I'm just kind of getting charged up there. Sometimes it's uh, uplifting and positive. Uh, I call, you know, I get my dopamine rush before, before I get out there and start fishing, so it really kind of depends, you know, on, on the vibe. But generally, it's it's upbeat music that's kind of charging me up as I'm as I'm getting wherever close to where I'm going. But I do like the '80s genre. It's probably my favorite genre. Awesome. Um, you're headed out the door to fish. What's one thing that you won't forget when you're going out fishing? My net. Net. Yeah. What about what is something that you can't leave the house without? Something you're superstitious about that you have to have with you whenever you fish? Uh, geez, usually it's my, I have a, rod, a go to rod that I use. I don't know if it's really superstition, but my Sage 5 weight TCR in Large Arbor uh, Orvis Bat and Kill 2 reel goes everywhere with me. I, I can't remember a fishing trip that I haven't taken that rod since I've got it 20 years ago. 
and it looks like it. it's worn out. I'm just waiting. <laughs> I don't want to. Not gonna, I'm not even going to say it. So it goes. It goes everywhere with me. It's going to always go everywhere with me. We get. We'll we'll paint the picture in our head. So, right. What's uh, something you wish you knew when you first started YouTubing? Um, the really kind of going back is filtering out some of the noise, right? Uh, thicker skin. Yeah. Early on. Uh, what's the best piece of advice that you could give your younger self? Best piece of advice I can give my younger self uh, as it relates to fly fishing? Yeah, fly fishing or just personally. Yeah. Uh, I wish I would have in, in I wish I would have had more courage to explore new places when I was younger. I would always go back to the same spots that I caught fish, was apprehensive about going to a new lake or a new stream. I wish I would have told myself back then, you try new places, go discover new places. I wish I would have done more than that when I was earlier, a younger. You're inspiring me, Dan. I'm I'm that guy. I like have my spots that I like to fish seasonally. Yeah. That's what I go and do. But it's like that consistency aspect. Like I know what I'm gonna get, right? Yep. But Keaton, if you finally fish that river you've been driving past every single day or that lake it is yeah. so fulfilling uh, i can tell you from experience because i've only recently really started to do that and i've discovered some incredible fisheries by just trying and exploring like incredible stuff one of which i'll share with you kyle off air sounds good because it's in your neck of the woods Sweet. i'm i'm excited to hear it <laughs> All right. All right, I'll go for it. You're the best. No, you're the guy. No, 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 no you're good. I, no, you do it. Take it, and I'll do the exit. Okay, so we like to end every uh, episode, Dan, with um, your favorite uh, fishing story ever. Could be fly fishing, could be spin fishing. It's your favorite uh, fishing story. Oh, my gosh. Well... I hate, you know, I don't want to repeat a story because one of the, one of the coolest, most recent stories was that one, uh, with, with Kobe where we had this epic dry fly day. So I already told that story, but that was pretty cool. I mean, that's, that's a story that has actually inspired the presentation that I do now for fly clubs because it's such a cool story. I mean, it's for him to be able to think outside the box and, and figure that out and catch Lahat and Cutthroat, turn them around on these giant erasers that we're throwing. They're swimming by and you throw that out there, they'll turn around and eat it. It was just such a cool moment. But I think something that really stands out is when I went to Christmas Island for my second trip, uh, my godson, Ren, and I went, and we were fishing for giant trevally. So we had a day that we, we were going to try to land one of those big giant trevallies on a fly rod. First ca cast on my 12-way rod, Fly strike breaks the rod right in half. So I'm <laughs> like, now what? So I had, it's actually in my video, I said it was an eight weight, but it's a nine weight. I misspoke. So it's a nine weight. It's a nine weight Sage XI2 that I was using for bonefish. And I said, screw it. So I took my big Reddington giant, you know, reel off, put it on my XI2, and I landed a 90 pound GT on a nine weight. Wow. And nearly spooled me, burned out the reel. The drag was toast, right? And the Reddington had a cork uh, drag on it, but it completely eliminated the cork. There was nothing left. It was palming it at the very end. Holy I God. could hear the rod making noises down by the butt. So I didn't put too much pressure on it. I was pointing it at the fish most of the time because if I were to rear back, it would have busted the rod right at the cork. And... I ended up landing that gigantic GT 40 minutes later on a nine weight. Crazy. And that rod, it's one of the, we talk about favorite rods, right? That rod, the five weight goes with me. The Sage TCR goes everywhere I go. Any type of trout fishing, that Sage XI2 goes everywhere saltwater fishing. I have caught fish up in Alaska on the Igigik River. I've caught uh, bonefish. I've caught giant trevally. I've caught, I spent three hours battling over a hundred pound 
uh, tarpon on that nine weight. Um, I've caught some incredible fish. I've broken the rod twice. <laughs> Once when I was on the Egeek River, we were flying over and there were clouds of fish or what I thought were seaweed, but there were clouds of fish over the over the river. So the, the pilot circled around, landed, landed on the river. I caught so many wild silver coho salmon that finally I was netting one and, and trying to trying to get it in the net and it ran and it broke the tip. I ended up fishing the rest of the day with two thirds of a rod. Cause I had the wind to my back. So I was still able to cast it, but that rod has been so many places and caught so many cool fish, but that was the, that GT was probably one that really stuck out the most. Cause I was actually able to land it. That's insane. That's, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. That's and what cool. A, the rod tells a story too. I mean, every time you take it out, it's kind of like a flashback to all these memories, huh? I believe it. Yeah. And my, my dad, who's still with us, thankfully, he lives in West Virginia. He's not fly fishing a- anymore, really at all, because he's in his, his 80s and can't really get around. So he all of a sudden, all this gear started coming to me. One of my favorite rods is a, is a Winston that has his name embroidered on it, a little three weight. And that's that's been a, a rod that's been going almost everywhere with me now as well, because it has a lot of nostalgia and it's caught a lot of fish and has a lot of good fish karma. It's feel like my dad's with me the whole time I'm fishing it because his name's always right down on the right above the cork every time I look down at it. So it's, it's, okay. uh, it is, I mean, there's, you know, some people believe fly rods or and rods in general are kind of disposable. There are probably a few that are, but you know, a lot of them over time start, there's a little, there's so much memory and so many experiences and that happen with that fly rod. I can't wait to, pass those down myself to my family and because I, I really do believe there's there's some pretty good pretty good energy that gets built up in a particular rod that you're fond of and use and have used all over the place and catch some amazing fish and amazing experiences yeah that's, cool. that's why i never check my rods ever if i'm traveling um i don't leave ever leave a rod in the car and thank god for that new third hand opros things i've carried two rods in one of my hand before because i won't don't want to leave any of that stuff and and risk risk it being stolen or something like that yeah. so break a rod you could always fix it you know i just would it would be devastating to, to lose some of those rods because they are they become part of you i know that was a really long answer to your quick question so sorry about that no that's great we love it well, that was another episode of the Young Guides podcast. We just really want to thank Flyfish Dan for hopping on and taking time out of his busy schedule to hop on with some young guides. You know, it's it's an honor to talk to him and what an inspiration he's doing for all the fishing community in the Pacific Northwest. So really, really proud of Dan. And uh, you'll probably see him in future podcasts or maybe you'll see us in some future videos on on his youtube so make sure to go show some love uh dan what's your youtube channel so people can fly fish dan fly fish dan plain and simple right on the platter just served right to you go check it out um follow him on uh instagram right it's also fly fish dan yeah and, and you got as well facebook too so make sure to go show some love follow um subscribe um, it means a lot to him and it means a lot to us to, to see him, uh, excel. So thank so, you, Keith, Kyle. Appreciate you having me. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Some, uh, upcoming events. We got, uh, January, uh, Friday, January 13th. We're doing a fly tying event. Um, you can find that on Eventbrite. Um, well, the spaces are limited. We're filling that one up. Um, we're really excited about that one. Um, we also are doing on a Friday, January 27th, we're doing a turkey talk with Russ. Um, that's going to be awesome. He's going to talk about everything turkeys um, and just kind of get you better, better and ready for spring turkey. So, And the fly tent event's going to be, we're going to partner with Snoqualmie Rod Co. Uh, Wes is a great guy and he's going to be teaching us a couple uh, uh, trout patterns and steelhead patterns. So can't wait for those. And then stay tuned because we're going to be putting on some in February, uh, March, April, May, hopefully up till May. And then that's kind of when we start getting busy again. So um, we're really excited to be hosting these and we hope to see some of you there.
Um, I also want to promote Dan's hosted trip coming up. Uh, I know it's 12 months away, but it's, uh, it's a great time to start planning for that kind of stuff. You know, you can save up, you can get into, it, uh, talk to Dan, get to learn more about the trip. So if you're interested in that, you can reach out to Dan through social media, Dan. Yes. Or my website. I do have a website now, flyfishdan.com. All right. Go visit flyfishdan.com and reach out to him. And, um, I'm just, I can guarantee it's going to be a great time. So um, what a way to experience a, a fly out trip. It should be amazing. Uh, thank you. We all, yeah, absolutely. Uh, we also want to just thank everyone for uh, taking the time and listening to our podcast and showing us love uh, without you guys. It'd be nothing. So uh, I know we say this every time, but uh, we're just, we're just ecstatic to have people take the time and listen to some of the knowledge that we've learned. And then uh, if you can show us some love, Uh, Go give us a follow on Instagram. Shout out to all the people who helped us reach 700. Uh, That's crazy. In a year, you know, we went from pretty much zero to 700 in a year. And that that means a lot to us. So if you're liking what you're hearing uh, and you can go on to Apple Podcasts for us, uh, leave us a review. Let us know how we're doing. If we're doing great, we'd love a great review. Uh, If there's things we can improve on, you can leave us a review there or visit our website and send us uh, uh, one of our, uh, what do you call that? I'm spacing it, Kyle. Email, contact? Yeah, our contact. Yeah, we have like a contact tab on our our, uh, website. So you can go there or you can reach out through social media too. Um, If you're looking to be on our podcast or you think you know someone that might want to be on our podcast, reach out to us and we love to try to get in contact with them. Um, That's how we, we, I knew Dan, but uh, that's how I got, I got to meet Dan was through, you know, Facebook pages and getting to know him. So uh, we just really appreciate that. Um, Kyle, anything else we want to add here? Uh, nope. I, I think that's about it. Um, appreciate everybody listening. Appreciate Dan for coming on. And um, we're super stoked for this uh, 2023 season. Um, we've got a lot of great um, guests planned coming down the pipe here in the next few weeks. But, you know, we're excited to see where we're going into the rest of the year and the guests that we can have on return guests. Um, you know, what comes to return guests um, now that we've talk to that person, got their background. Now we can go a little bit more in depth in certain topics. So we're excited to uh, bring you guys that in this next season. Yeah, absolutely. One thing, one more thing I want to add is make sure to go show our partners some love. Uh, Alaska Rodco, Heather's Choice, uh, Shelly Art Studio, um, Lucky Bug Lures, uh, Northern Knits, and then NWTF South Sound Strutters. Uh, all of them are doing great stuff for the industry. As much as they are business, they also are really about conservation. And so that's why they pair nicely with me and Kyle. So we're really excited to have those people on board. All those people join and, um, yeah, we're just we're just stoked. Just super excited about 2023. And uh yeah, we're blessed for sure. So um with that being said, this was another episode of the Young Guides Podcast, and we'll catch you on the next one. Fish on. You the music. <laughs>